You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Falk. Here he is, Jacob Ball. Hey, sports fans, welcome. To another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk, except no imitation. I've got to start with Sixers Bucks. Look, I had a lot of fun on Wednesday when they got blown out by the Celtics with James Harden watching. I took my little digs. I had a little fun. But I've got to be fair. That was an incredibly impressive performance by the Sixers last night. Joel Embiid made shots that I didn't know he could make. Step back, freeze. This guy's seven feet tall. Seven footers should not be making step back threes. That was honestly one of the most impressive games I've ever seen Joel Embiid have. 42 points, 14 rebounds, and 5 assists against a team like the Milwaukee Bucks? That was incredibly impressive. I mean, I've heard people say they're skeptical of the Sixers' playoff chances now. They have a guy in Harden who doesn't care about winning, supposedly. I disagree with that. I don't like James Harden. No one hates James Harden more than me, but I think he does care about winning. They have a coach that people say is overrated, and I'd agree with that. We put Doc Rivers in the upper echelon of NBA coaches. Should he really be there? This guy has only made two NBA Finals. He's been coaching for 23 seasons. I'm not saying he's a bad coach. He's not, but I don't think he's great. Look, do I think that the 76ers are going to win an NBA title? The answer is no. But, again, I've got to be fair. They now have one of the best duos in basketball in Embiid and Harden. They have a really strong supporting cast with Tobias Harris, Tyrese Maxey, Matisse Thibel, Firkin Korkmaz, and Danny Green. The Eastern Conference is wide open. I said the other day that there were eight teams that I could see winning the NBA title. Six of them are in the Eastern Conference. It's going to be a dogfight. It's going to be really fun to watch. We're going to have a lot of seven-game series. A team like the 76ers could bubble up to the top. I'm not saying they will. I'm not saying they won't. I think it's possible. I really think it's possible. You want to tell me that it took a Herculean effort from Joel Embiid to knock off the Bucks? That doesn't bode well for the Sixers' playoff chances? Okay, I see where you're coming from. But realize, no James Harden. 
All right, Harden's still a great player. I don't like him, but he's a great player. And I understand that the Bucks were a little banged up in this game as well. No DeAndre Bembry, no George Hill, obviously no Brooke Lopez, no Grayson Allen, no Pat Connaughton. The Bucks right now are not a deep team, but look. The Sixers went into Milwaukee after being embarrassed by the Celtics. And Joel Embiid had one of his best games ever. He hit shots that I don't think I've ever seen him hit before. I've got to be fair. Nothing would make me more upset than to see the Sixers win the NBA title, but... It's a distinct possibility. That's all I'm saying. As for the Bucks, this is what happens when you're without five solid players. I mean, you have Lindell Wigginton playing 16 minutes. I'm pretty sure I've said this before about Lindell Wigginton. 99% of Bucks fans wouldn't know this guy if he came to their house and delivered them a pizza. Does this guy have a long career in the NBA ahead of him? I don't know. Probably not. I think the smart money is on him not having that type of career. Let's put it this way. Do you see him getting playoff minutes? I don't. The Bucks aren't at 100% right now, but they still put up 120 points. I mean, they did have a chance to win it at the end, but Chris Middleton bricked the tying three. Then after Korkmaz lost the ball out of bounds, Middleton missed a desperation three. If you want to blame anyone for this loss, blame Chris Middleton. He shot just 6 for 20 from the field and was 2 for 12 from beyond the arc. He's got to do better than that. I mean, the Bucks really should have won this game. You have your big three going up against a Sixers team that only has one half of their dynamic duo playing. And you're home, and the Sixers got their doors blown off by the Celtics on Tuesday. That's a game that the Bucks should have won. But make no mistake about it, that was an important game. Would it stun you if those two teams went at it in the Eastern Conference Finals? As much as it kills me to say it, It wouldn't stun me. I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen with the Nets going forward. Sure, the Sixers and Bucks can go at it in the Eastern Conference Finals. That's very possible. I could see that happening. I'll say this. I'm going to have a really tough time making picks on the Eastern Conference side of the bracket. It's just so wide open. I've said that before. I'll say it again. I could see six teams in the East going to the NBA Finals. And maybe even winning it. The Heat, the Bulls, the Sixers, the Cavs, the Bucks, and the Nets. Like I said, it's going to be a dogfight. It's going to be very fun to watch. There's no question about that. It's going to be nerve-wracking if you're a fan of one of those teams. Like, the last 23 games of the next season is going to make me pull my hair out. And the playoffs, oh, forget about it. I'm going to go nuts. But if you're impartial, it's going to be really fun to watch. Moving on now to Mavericks Pelicans. And the epic performance by Luka Doncic. 
He had 49 points, 15 rebounds, and 8 assists. The Mavericks beat the Pelicans 125-118. to In Doncic's last four games, he has scored at least 45 points in three of them. He is one of my favorite players in the NBA to watch. You hear people mentioning Joel Embiid for MVP, Giannis, DeRozan, Trey Young, Kevin Durant, John Morant, Nikola Jokic, Steph Curry, guys like that. Mention Luka. Luka deserves to be in the conversation. I'm not saying he'd get my vote. All I'm saying is he deserves to be in the conversation. He's honestly one of my favorite players in the NBA to watch. And since the trade deadline, when they retooled their roster and traded Porzingis, they're 3-1. and one. Jalen Brunson has really stepped up. Maxi Kleber has been leading the bench unit recently for the Mavs. They're a fun team to watch. Maybe they don't have a ton of household names besides Luka. Like, unless you're a big NBA fan, how much do you really know about Jalen Brunson? How much do you really know about Dorian Finney-Smith? How much do you really know about Dwight Powell? How much do you really know about Davis Bertans? Or Spencer Dinwiddie or someone like that? But when you watch them play, they're a fun team. They play with a lot of energy. Jason Kidd has them playing really good basketball right now. They're 7-3 in their last 10. I don't think anyone looks at them as an NBA title threat, but they're a fun team. They can make some noise. The big issue, sooner rather than later, is going to be how do you build around Luka? Because it's not going to be enough to just make the playoffs and get bounced in the first or second round. When you have a talent like Luka Doncic... You've got to make the NBA Finals. In fact, you've got to win it. It's not enough to just be in the playoff mix. You've got to make some noise and then some. The Mavericks are a fun team. I just worry about their ability to really make a lot of noise going forward. They really need that second guy to pair with Luka. I don't know who that's going to be. Like, truthfully, James Harden would have made sense. Harden gets to go back to Texas. He lives in Houston. If he doesn't want to be the primary ball handler... Okay, Luca does that anyway. Bradley Beal would make sense. Damian Lillard would make sense. The Mavericks really should be aggressive in adding talent. I mean, they retooled the roster and they're playing good basketball right now, but... Do we view them as an NBA title threat? I don't think so. Do we even think that they're going to beat the Jazz in the first round? Probably not, right? They need that second guy. It should have been Porzingis. He just couldn't stay healthy. It's sad. Like, even if you're a Knicks fan, and you don't like Porzingis, you don't like how it ended, 
You know, he didn't like the stunt that his brother pulled or whatever. I think we can all agree that in a perfect world, Porzingis never would have gotten hurt and you would have been able to build around that unicorn. Think about it. If Porzingis pans out, you don't have Julius Randle. Maybe you don't have R.J. Barrett, but you're not stuck with Randall. That's one of those interesting butterfly effect scenarios. What if Porzingis never became injury prone? I mean, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but one thing that I really like is alternate history. Stuff like, what if Hawaii never became a state? Or what if Texas was divided among multiple states? What if the War of 1812 had turned out differently, etc., etc.? And there are a lot of YouTube channels that post videos on stuff like that. You really don't see a lot of sports alternate history. Think about it. How different would sports history be if Babe Ruth was never traded to the Yankees? How different would sports history be if Wayne Gretzky was never traded to the Kings? How different would sports history be if the Jets took Dan Marino instead of Ken O'Brien? How different would sports history be if the Nets never made that trade with the Celtics? Stuff like that is interesting to me. Like, honestly, you can make YouTube videos on it. I mean, you need to have the time and patience to do it and work out all the different scenarios and make it make sense. That's stuff that I can't do. Like, I can do simple ones, obviously. What if Porzingis never got hurt? Knicks don't have Julius Randle. They probably don't have R.J. Barrett. Those are easy. But how does everything else fall into place? How far does the butterfly effect go? That requires time and patience that I just don't have. You could make a YouTube channel out of it, though. I'll say that. I'd subscribe. I'll tell you that right now. Speaking of the Knicks, there was an interesting report that came out about them recently. According to Ian Begley of SNY, William Wesley, otherwise known as World Wide West, the Knicks executive vice president, is putting some of the team's struggles on Tom Thibodeau. Now, you may not think this is newsworthy, but it is. You have a high-ranking member of the Knicks front office saying to the owner, James Dolan, that Tom Thibodeau is partly to blame for the Knicks' failures this year. Now, we don't know if Thibodeau is truly on the hot seat, but the Knicks' record speaks for itself. They're the 12 seed right now. They're three and a half games behind the Hawks for the 10 seed. Technically the 9 seed also because the Hornets and Hawks are tied right now. But the point is, the Knicks right now face an uphill climb to make the playoffs. All the optimism that people had about the Knicks 
headed into this year, that has evaporated. I mean, some Knicks fans were skeptical. Like, I spoke to three different Knicks fans that told me, Jacob, this season's not going to turn out how you think it is. This is going to be a failure. Randall's going to regress. You watch. The Knicks are going to struggle this year. I didn't believe them. I was saying to them, you have an all-star. You made the playoffs for the first time in eight years. Yes, it was a disappointing series, but enjoy the fact that you were in the playoffs. You have a young roster. It's going to get better. You'll be fine. Holy moly, was I wrong. Julius Randle has fallen off more than any other athlete Maybe in New York history, who has fallen off more than Randall? I mean, again, Randall was an all-star last year. He was the guy who you could build around and get you back into the playoffs. Now, the vast majority of Knicks fans wanted him to be traded. You know, it's not abnormal for fans to turn on a player. Especially in this city. But to have such a stark drop-off like this, it's basically unprecedented. I'm struggling to think of anyone that's had this kind of a drop-off. Eli Manning towards the end? That was gradual. Darren Williams? Maybe. Although I'd argue Randall's is worse. The Knicks are without question one of the most disappointing teams in the NBA this year. In fact, they're arguably the most disappointing team this year. So the question is, should Tom Thibodeau go? Like, here's the thing. We think that when a coach receives criticism from the front office, that means automatically he's going. Not necessarily. Maybe this is World Wide West's way of trying to light a fire under Tibbs. Maybe this is his way of saying, if you don't buckle down and finish respectably and get us in the play-in tournament or better, we're going to have some hard conversations about your future. That's okay. It's okay. To want to light a fire under your coach. To put him on death ground, so to speak. Should World Wide West be the guy doing this? If he's acting independently, the answer is no. Because he doesn't have the final say on basketball matters. Leon Rose does. So if one of Rose's deputies is reaching out to the owner and saying Tom Thibodeau is to blame at least partly for the way this season is gone, I mean, that's tough. If World Wide West did that by himself, if I'm Leon Rose, I'm furious. You can't go behind my back and criticize my coach to the owner. But if Rose shared those sentiments with World Wide West, and World Wide West is just relaying those to Dolan and saying, hey, this is what we think, and World Wide West is just taking the aggro for Rose, that's different. Is there dysfunction with the Knicks right now? Yeah, but it actually can be fixed. Like, I like Leon Rose. I hated the hire at the time, but 
I like what he's done. The Cam Reddish trade made sense to me. The Emmanuel quickly pick looks really smart. I do like Evan Fournier, even though the Knicks overpaid for him. The Kemba Walker signing made sense at the time. Quentin Grimes looks like a solid player. I like Leon Rose. I don't think he deserves to go. Does Tibbs deserve to go? You can make the argument for it. See, the thing with Thibodeau is the young players that the Knicks have will not get better with him as the coach. And he's in essence said that. He's in essence said, you've got to earn the right to play in this league. Just because you're young doesn't mean I'm going to give you an opportunity. Well, wait a minute. Wait just a second. How can they earn the right to play in this league if you're not giving them PT? What, you want them to ball out in the one game that they play, the few garbage time minutes they get? That's not how the NBA works. You gotta let these guys play. Let them make their mistakes. Let them learn. Let them develop. The best way to develop is by playing. You learn more from doing than by watching. That's true in any profession. I'm not saying all the young guns deserve playing time, but certainly Obi Toppin deserves more minutes than Taj Gibson. Okay, I think we can all agree on that. I think we can all agree that Cam Reddish should get more minutes than Alec Burks. If you traded a first-round pick for this guy, and you want him to develop, he's 22, his story has not been completed yet, you've got to play him over Burks. You've got to play Quentin Grimes over Burks. Maybe you cut some of Fournier's minutes. Thibodeau won't do that. There are a lot of coaches who, even in a lost season, will refuse to play their young guns. And that's wrong. Would any Knicks fan be upset If guys like Toppin, Grimes, and Reddish, and guys like that got 30 minutes a night toward the end of this season? No. You want to see what you have in these guys. I don't want to say that Obi Toppin looks like a bust right now, but is he playing like an eighth overall pick? No. He's never looked like an 8th overall pick. Should the Knicks have taken Tyrese Halliburton? Yes, and I said that at the time. But I'm not writing Toppin off yet. I want to see him get a ton of minutes. And if he struggles, okay. I'll replace him. Same thing with Grimes. He's been playing well recently. Is that an aberration? Or is that for real? Let's see what he can do. I mean, recently he's been starting, but that's because R.J. Barrett got hurt because Thibodeau stupidly left him in during a blowout loss. Cam Reddish should be playing more. There's no question about that. You trade a first-round pick for this guy, let him play. And also, I'll say this. A good coach 
would be able to fix Julius Randle. Thibodeau has not done that. Randle's points per game are down. His field goal percentage is down. His three-point percentage is way down. This guy looks like a shell of his former self. This guy won most improved player last year. He has talent. Thibodeau should be able to fix him, and he's not. That's an issue. Like, I can make the argument that the Knicks should fire Thibodeau. And you want to bring in a guy like Kenny Atkinson? Someone who I wanted the Knicks to hire before they hired Thibodeau? Great. Fantastic. That would be a home run hire. If anyone can get these young guns going, it's Atkinson. The reality is, if Tom Thibodeau is not going to play these young guns, he does deserve to go. I understand that you maybe don't want the front office meddling in coaching decisions. I understand that's not a great look. The thing is, though, the front office would be right if they said to Thibodeau, we want you to play these guys more. We don't know why World Wide West thinks that Thibodeau is partly to blame for the team's struggles. If it's something like he's not playing well with us, okay, fair enough, but in a perfect world, I think you'd like the answer to be we brought in some players who have a lot of potential and Thibodeau's not playing them so they're not getting better. That's a big issue for us. We don't want to rely on all these veterans. We want to develop a pipeline of young talent. If World Wide West said something like that to Dolan, I'm fine with that. He should have Rose's blessing if he said something like that. Because let me ask you something. How would you feel if you had a subordinate question another hire that you made? That would tick you off, right? All in all, if the Knicks wanted to move on from Thibodeau for a guy like Kenny Atkinson, I'd be fine with it. But I can also make the argument that Thibodeau deserves to stay. How's this for a stat? The last Knicks head coach... To make it to a third season was Mike D'Antoni. That third season was the 10-11 season. So over 10 years ago now. Before that, you've got to go back to Jeff Van Gundy. It would make sense if the Knicks said... We want to keep Tibbs here. He helped get us to the playoffs last year. Our defense is still really good. We've just got to flesh out the offense. And we think that Thibodeau will do that. Whether it's by adjusting his offensive philosophy, or by bringing in a new assistant coach to lead the offense. Because if you want to boil it down to the ground, the seminal reason that the Knicks are struggling 
is their offense. No player on the Knicks is averaging 20 points per game. They're 27th in the league in field goal percentage. They're dead last in the league in two-pointers made. Like, the thing is, the Knicks don't have a bad roster. Yes, Julius Randle has taken a step back, and if you want to move on from him, that's fine. But you still have R.J. Barrett. Evan Fournier's overpaid, but is having a good season. He's shooting 39.5% from beyond the arc. He's putting up 14.5 points per game. He's a good player. Derek Rose, when healthy, has been good. Kemba Walker's been solid since coming back from Tibbs' doghouse. And the young guns that the Knicks have, I do think, have potential. I think quickly can turn into a really good player in this league. Same thing with Mitchell Robinson. Same thing with Obi Toppin. Same thing with Quentin Grimes. Same thing with Cam Reddish. Even a guy like Jericho Sims. It wouldn't stun me if he turned into something solid. The Knicks have the pieces necessary to fix this. It's just all about getting them there. Can Tibbs do it? I think he can, but... But if he doesn't, bring in Kenny Atkinson. I'll say this. If the Knicks are going to make the playoffs this year, it's not going to be because of guys like Alec Burks, Taj Gibson, and Nerlens Noel. It's going to be because of guys like Obi Toppin, Quentin Grimes, and Cam Reddish. The Knicks have tried guys like Burks, Gibson, and Noel. It hasn't worked. They're nine games under 500. If you give the young guns a chance, you might get into the playoffs. Maybe you won't, but it's worth a shot. I'd rather lose with young guns than lose with veterans. There's no question about that. I'll close this show out with some NHL vault talk. And I'll start with Penguins Maple Leafs. Jack Campbell made 45 saves to lead the Leafs to a 4-1 win over the Penguins. What's been the biggest issue that the Leafs have had? We know about their offensive talent. Matthews, Tavares, Nylander, Marner, etc., etc. What's prevented them from winning a playoff series? Because they haven't won a playoff series since 2004 when they beat the Senators in seven games. Lack of goaltending. But Jack Campbell, in his first year as full-time Leaf starter, has been outstanding. Last year, it was supposed to be Frederick Anderson. Then Campbell came in and immediately looked better. So Anderson goes to the Hurricanes in the offseason... And is probably going to win the Vesna Trophy. Leafs are okay with that, though, because Jack Campbell is a Vesna Trophy candidate also. He's 23-7-3. He has a 9-24 save percentage, a 2-3-3 goals against. I understand that last year against the Habs, 
he really laid an egg. In the final three games of that series, he gave up at least three goals in every game. The thing is, though, his offense really didn't help him much. Game five, the final score was four to three. Nick Suzuki won the game less than a minute into overtime. Okay, that's all on Campbell. You've got to hold the Habs to less than four goals. I understand that. Game six, Campbell was really hung out to dry. The game was scoreless through the first 40 minutes. Then the Leafs took a bunch of really stupid penalties. The Canadians went up 2-0 on two power play goals. The Leafs tied it. Then Jesperi Kotkaniemi won it in overtime for the Habs. That's not on Campbell. That's on his supporting cast. In Game 7, the Leafs' offense went dry. Carey Price was great, made 30 saves, only allowed one goal, but still, to only put up one goal in a Game 7, that's bad. But this Leafs team, this team looks better They're tied for having the fourth most goals in the NHL. They're not allowing a ton of goals. Give guys like Morgan Riley, TJ Brody, Jake Muzzin, and obviously Campbell a ton of credit. When I watch the Leafs, I see a team that very easily could win the Stanley Cup. I'm not saying they will. I mean, they're going to have their hands full with the Lightning in the first round. If the season ends today, that's what the matchup is. The thing is, though, when you watch them play, you see a team with a ton of talent, a great goalie, a really good defense. The Leafs are talented enough to win the Stanley Cup. The way I see it, there were really only a handful of teams that could win the Cup. The Panthers, depending on what happens with Sergei Bobrovsky. I understand he's been really good this year, but he has a history of falling apart in the playoffs. You can view the Panthers as Stanley Cup contenders, but realize there's a big what-if there. The Lightning is back-to-back champs need to be mentioned. The Leafs. The Penguins. Tristan Jari's played out of his mind this year. If Genny Malkin's back and is a point-of-game player... Jake Gensel's a point-of-game player. Sidney Crosby's a point-of-game player. Brian Rust is a point-of-game player. You've got to view the Penguins as a Stanley Cup contender. Hurricanes, maybe, just because of their defense and their goaltending, but I'm not in love with their offense. They're in that second tier with the Panthers. And then in the Western Conference, there were really only two teams that I look at as Stanley Cup contenders. The Avalanche, who have been the best team in hockey basically all year. And the Flames, just because Jacob Markstrom has been so fantastic. And that defense is really good too. I like their offense, too, but it's mainly because of Markstrom and that defense. So just to put a finer point on it, in the top tier, you have the Lightning, the Leafs, the Penguins, 
the Avalanche, and the Flames. In the second tier, you have the Panthers and Hurricanes. It'll be interesting to see how the Stanley Cup playoffs, the best playoffs in sports, shake out. Moving on now to Ducks Oilers. The Oilers absolutely creamed the Ducks last night, 7-3. to three. And don't look now, but the Oilers are a playoff team right now. They're the three seed in the Pacific Division. They're two points up on the Kings and Ducks. Jay Woodcroft has coached four games with the Oilers. The Oilers have won every game. Before he got there, the Oilers looked like a team that would limp into the playoffs And would be bounced in the first round. Now? It would be a really competitive series. Between the Oilers and Golden Knights. In fact. I think the Oilers could win that series. I don't think the Golden Knights would have the offense necessary to take advantage. Of the Oilers shoddy goaltending. The Oilers right now look a lot more balanced than they were under Dave Tippett. Connor McDavid isn't being asked to do as much. Same thing with a guy like Leon Dreisaitl, although he did have two goals yesterday. McDavid had two assists. But guys like Evander Kane, Zach Hyman... Cody Cece, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, and Darnell Nurse are getting a lot of ice time, too. Under Tippett, it was just McDavid and Dreisaitl, McDavid and Dreisaitl, McDavid and Dreisaitl. Now, Jay Woodcroft has more of a balanced approach, and it's not running McDavid and Dreisaitl as ragged. The supporting cast is stepping up. Evander Kane looks like a great addition to the Oilers. Zach Hyman's having a really good season. Ryan Nugent Hopkins looks better under Woodcroft than he did under Tippett. The Oilers still need to add goaltending. And I wouldn't be surprised if Semyon Varlamov finished this year with the Oilers. But there's no question about it. The Oilers look like a much better team under Jay Woodcroft than they did under Dave Tippett. This looks like a team that can make some noise in the playoffs. And Woodcroft looks like he should be the full-time coach going forward. I understand that we still have to finish the season, but so far it's looking really good for Woodcroft in Edmonton, let me tell you. You'll get a Brooklyn Nets show on Monday night. Regular episodes of the Jacob Volk Show come your way every weekday afternoon. Until next time... I'm Jacob Volk, and always remember, if you disagree with me, you're wrong.